Welcome to Bill Dad. It is now, we finished round one, it is now time for round two, so let us dive right in. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered, again, shortest man in the Bible, How long will you say these things, and the words of your mouth be a mighty wind? Ah, we know Job is wrong, because Job is blaming God for his predicament and claiming that he is under judgment. So, Bildad's off to a good start here. Does God pervert justice, or does the Almighty pervert what is right? If your son sins against him, then he delivered them into the power of their transgression. If you would see God and implore the compassion of the Almighty. If you are pure and upright, surely now he would rouse himself for you and restore your righteous estate. You know, we were this close to getting that right, weren't we? And then we had to go and throw this in there. So let's stop for a second and let's back up. Is God just? Yes. Will he pervert justice and do what is wrong? No. This is a consistent theme from Scripture. So things like Psalm 37. Depart from evil and do good, so you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. Now notice again already right there in Psalm 37. Where is that termination of justice found? It is moved into eternity, into God. God's eternal judgment, not into a temporal judgment. Something like 2 Peter chapter 2 points you to the justice of God also. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the end of the world and the, of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, and having made them an example to those who live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation, to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Notice the depth of what Peter is talking about as opposed to the superficialness of Eliphaz and Bildad. Eliphaz and Bildad up until now have said what? If you were good, you'd have gotten good. But because you've gotten bad, then you must be bad. You, this is a one-to-one -one reaping and sowing here. Notice as Scripture expounds and as Scripture is building upon the character of God, where are all of these things moved? One of the examples, I think you can summarize that Second Peter passage really simply. Something I've told you a bunch of times. God is capable of chewing gum and walking down the street at the same time. God is capable of preserving his children while judging sin. God is capable of bringing people through calamity while judging them in the midst of calamity. God is capable of doing all of these things at the same time. What you have to figure out is where do you stand and why are you standing there? That's where we should be pointing Job. That is where we are not pointing Job. Therefore, we're not actually refuting anything that Job has said up until now. And I've warned you, go home because we're not going to read every single verse in here, but you do it would do you well to go and read this and at least skim through it and try to think through, how would I comfort and counsel Job? How do I point him to the righteousness of God, the security of his soul in the midst of his struggles? So, we would agree that God is just, but see, this just gets us into a bad place right off the bat. If you are pure and upright, surely now he himself would rouse himself for you and restore your righteous estate. Verse 7, though your beginning was insignificant, your end will greatly increase. Please inquire of past generations. Consider the things searched out by their fathers, for we are only of yesterday and know nothing, because our days on earth are as a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you and bring forth words from their minds? So again, good. Let's go back and consult the wisdom of the ages. Let's go back and see how God has worked in history, how God has worked in the forefathers. But... If we attempt to apply all of that wisdom into one singular moment, have we understood God's working? No. That's why I'm constantly telling you your eyes need to be what? 
raised up. You need to be looking towards eternity, looking towards a kingdom, a city whose maker is God. Because if you don't, then I'm literally falling over. There you go. That's going to be a good day. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Here's failures, though. If this is a failure to understand God's mercy. Let's rewind in Scripture. Genesis 3. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Well, time out. Do you think Adam and Eve had kind of committed a big no-no? <laughs> I mean, you had one rule, right? And you couldn't get it right. And what should you have gotten for that? Death. We should have gotten the oh, 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 come on. We should have gotten a good old fashioned smiting. Ah. <laughs> See, you knew somebody was going to get smited, right? Or at least someone should have been. And yet, what does God do? God makes clothes from animal skins. Always remember this part. What did Adam and Eve cover themselves with? Fig leaves, because they are trying to cover the knowledge of their sin. Had, when did they really realize that something was wrong? When they realized they were naked. So they're covering the knowledge of their sin. They're covering their nakedness with fig leaves. Can that fig leaf cover their sin? No. The sacrifice offered by God of that animal. Because always remember, it's not like the end. It's not like some lamb wandered in the garden and be like, oh, they're naked and need clothes. Here, skin me. There, take, take some of my back and cover them. Now, in order for that animal to, to be made into clothes, what had to happen to it? Yeah. Death. Death. There was a sacrifice in place for Adam and Eve's sin. And then a covering was made for their nakedness. The symbol of their sin was covered by the sacrifice of God. That is mercy. That is not, you did wrong, God will punish you. You did right, God will reward you. That is, in the midst of your iniquity and sin, God has shown you grace and mercy that you did not deserve. He was good to you when he should have not been. From the very beginning, you're seeing the nature of God in salvation on display for his people. Bill Dad's missed that. Bill Dad's missed that completely. Let's continue on forward with God's righteousness. Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. He had other sons and daughters. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, that's an outlier in Genesis 5, in that long list of descendants that get you from Seth to Noah. If you've ever read Genesis 5, and I know like almost none of you have because we skimmed that one, there's a recurring theme there. And so-and-so had lived to be such-and-such such age, and he had a son, and he called him blah, blah, blah. And he lived, and he walked with God X number of years, and then what's the next line? And then he died. And then he died. And then he died. And in the middle of that, you see Enoch, and it's like, wait a minute. Enoch is the one outlier because he's the one who is described as walking with God. Which means even that faithful generation from Seth to Noah, even that good generation offering sacrifice, keeping the teaching, following what has been handed down from Adam and Eve, even then there is sin present. There is a need for mercy. There is a corruption of the flesh being displayed day by day, year by year, and yet God does not destroy them. God does not end them. In other words, what they should have received, do they? No. This is the wisdom of the elders that Bill Dad wants us to look at. Does it support his case? No, because he doesn't understand where righteousness is found. He doesn't understand where mercy is found. He doesn't understand the long view. We read Hebrews last week. We'll read it again. Hebrews 11, this long list of people, and then in the middle of it, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles upon the earth. Christian, that's you right now. How many saints have gone into glory without having received the full righteousness upon this planet? Thousands? Hundreds of thousands? I don't know. Were their lives lived in vain because God did not bring the kingdom in their lifetime? No. Was Abraham's life lived in vain because he didn't see a great nation? Was Joseph's life in vain because he did not receive the great nation? Was David's life in vain because he didn't get to see the temple? Was Solomon's life a complete waste because he was corrupt? No. 
because we're looking at a long view of history, a service and trusting unto and of God, knowing that at some point his work will be accomplished. We can see the promises he has kept and we can long for the fulfillment of the promises that he has made. This is where we're supposed to rest, to try and say, well, because I'm a Christian, because I'm seeking to do good, God will only give me the good. And if I've done evil, it is because if I'm receiving evil in this life is because I have done something wrong and God is now mad at me, is to fail to keep your eyes focused upon his eternal kingdom. And it is a really good job of focusing on your temporal kingdom. When we start with us and try to reason back to God, what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah. Destruction, fiery car crash, train wreck, whatever analogy you would like to use. We have to understand our world by starting where? Not with us, but with God and understanding down. Now again, the lesson here, when you receive good, is that because God is patting you on the head like you're some golden retriever? Like, good job, yes, you did a good job today. You get to be happy. No. And if you think like that, then you're just doing the same thought process on the other side of the coin. Likewise, when you had a miserable day, it's because you have sinned against the Lord and he is now punishing you. Ah, smiting. I don't know, maybe. You know how you got to figure that out? You. you do. You have to evaluate your life day by day, step by step. Have I looked at the world and been like, you know, this is just kicking me in the teeth lately. And all it is reminding me of is all the places where I have catered to my sin and I'm falling short and not trusting in God. That's a good thing, isn't it? Is that God, please stop punishing me? Or is that no? God, thank you for revealing the things of this world, my idolatry and the sins that have entangled and that you have shown them to me. This is, again, bringing your eyes up, not focusing on you and your condition, but focusing on the work that God is doing and where you are supposed to be. You ever go on a long hike? You plan, you pack, you load up stuff. Do you get there by walking like this? Because <laughs> what's going to happen? Take you, 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 one, it'll take you forever. But two, are you going to stay on the path? You gonna pay? You gonna see the dangers and the pitfalls that are coming your way? No. You have to do what? You have to see where you're going and plan out how this is supposed to work, and then be wary and wandering and cautious, and that way you can stay on the path and you can make provision for what's coming along with you. When you do that, you have a chance of succeeding. Christian, welcome to your life. We focus not on where we are, but where we are going and how we get there from here. This is the way you should be comforting the person in distress. This is the hope that we should be sharing with one another, not the place that we are. Look, let's be honest. How many of you are shocked the world is messed up? I mean, honestly. I mean, I point this out all the time, but too often we look at the play, we get into our own little bubble and we're like, I, you turn on the news, you turn on Facebook and you're like, what just happened? I can't believe. Yes, you can. If you're honest with yourself, you absolutely can. The broken, sinful people are doing broken, sinful things, brokenly and sinfully. Who'd thunk it, right? So we're doomed, right? Everything is lost because the planet is, you know, spinning into catastrophe. No. Sin is running its course. But Christian, I have an anchor. I have a hope. I have a home in a kingdom, and I have a weapon against the darkness of the world that I can wield and use to proclaim his mercy and his goodness on a daily basis. I do not have despair because I have the life of Christ, his righteousness, his accomplishment, and his goodness in all of these things. This is where lifting your eyes and keeping your focus up is so helpful. So... Bill Dad's going to try to justify his argument by, um, by giving an example. He's going to go to botany. Uh, verse 11, can the papyrus grow without a marsh? Can the rushes grow without water? While it is still green and not cut down, yet it withers before any other plant. Okay, this is important. Plants need what they need to grow, and when they are done growing, they do what? They die. This is the natural occurrence of all of life. Ecclesiastes 3. There's an appointed time for everything. There is a time for every event under heaven. This is how God operates. This is part of Sunday school this morning. This is the providential working of God. Galatians 4. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. 
We're not going to go into all of that, but realize that if you told Job that, that there would be a son born, unborn of a woman, born under the law, Job would have said what? What law? There's not a Moses yet. There's, we're waiting for the seed of a woman, yeah, but we don't have a law. We don't know where that's going to be. We don't, what do you mean we're redeemed from the curse of a law? How can the law be a curse? If we don't have it yet. That time frame has not come yet. God is still at work, still ordaining and arranging and organizing. We would agree with that. So he continues, though. So are the paths of all who forget God, and the hope of the godless will perish, whose confidence is fragile and whose trust is a spider's web. You can continue all the way on through verse 19. A life lived without God is a life that is doomed. To which, if you've read the rest of your Bible, you would say what? Yes, I agree. Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law He meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In whatever He does, He prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish." Once again, though, you have to define righteousness rightly, and you have to define judgment rightly. Where will your righteousness be revealed, Christian? In eternity. Where will judgment be final and good and complete? In eternity as well. Notice, will not stand at the judgment. Where is your righteousness, therefore, in the here and now supposed to be found, Christian? Where will your righteousness be found? Why, why do you have righteousness? Because of the work that Christ has done. The accomplishment that He has made. The imputed righteousness that He has given you. Is that new in the New Testament? Like all of a sudden, people were running around being like, No, 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 no. If I try really, really hard, if I do it just right, I will be good. And if I am good, then God will love me and bless me and secure me. No, let's, let's take Bildad's advice and let's consult those elders again. Genesis chapter 6. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and these are the generations of Noah. Noah was, a, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Where was Noah's righteousness found? In God. In the work that Christ would complete. Where's Job's righteousness to be found? Remember, we said this before. Job is described as blameless and upright. Does that mean sinless and perfect? No. It means a righteousness that is found because it has been granted by God. It is found as Job has rested in Him. We will know that because Job is, Job is going to be fun in a few minutes, so I will not spoil that. We will get to that shortly. So... Here's where the misunderstanding goes completely off the rails. Verse 20. We're going to skip ahead, Sally. God will not reject a man of integrity, nor will he support the evildoer. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouting. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the tent of the wicked will be no longer. Does that align with the wisdom we find in Scripture later on? I mean, you've never seen an unrighteous person prosper in the world, have you? You've never seen that, right? They all stub their toes constantly, fall down, their teeth are all crooked, and everything goes terribly for all the unrighteous people in the world. <laughs> you may wish that, but is that how it is? And everybody that you know that is striving and trying to be godly and is seeking to walk a righteous path, it's just amazing for them all the time, right? Their businesses succeed, they get good grades, everything's just perfect for them all the time. See, because you live in a real world and you actually see what happens. Do you see the problem Bill Dad's got? This is a world that is built on what? The way things are and the way God actually operates or the way that Bill Dad would like to think that God operates? Now, this becomes important. Even if you like what I'm telling you, and even if you wish that the things that I say were true, if they are based upon my ideas about the world and what I would like to be true about God, what fancy theological word should we assign to that sort of thing? It's idolatry. 
That is a God made in my image. That is a God of my imagination. I always like to grab these from history because I've told you this before, that there is no man-made religion that doesn't start with and focus upon people. What you must do to appease whatever deity they want to pray for or whatever deity they want to accomplish. So when you go into your Old Testament, well, we need crops this year, so our God of the sky must be appeased, so we must offer sacrifice so that he will send us the rains, or we must do something for the river so that it will give us the floods so that the, the, the soil will have its deposit. Um, nothing's changed, by the way. And usually these gods are very self-serving. My favorite modern example of this is Mormonism. So Joseph Smith trying to build a religion on a really broken understanding of what's supposed to be in Scripture because he didn't actually understand what was supposed to be in Scripture. So he finally comes up with this idea a few years down the line. You know what? It'd be a good idea if we could have multiple wives. Because if I'm going to be in charge of things, you know what I want. He wants women. It just so happened that right about the time that his wife started complaining that she didn't like the idea of him marrying other women, can you imagine why she might not like that idea, that he got a revelation from God that God told him it was okay that he could marry other women and that she needed to get over it? <laughs> Isn't that so convenient and helpful? Imagine that. Well, why was it convenient and helpful? Because it's his own imagination. It's a God made in His image, in His likeness, to serve what? His desires and wants, rather than to serve the work that God is accomplishing for righteousness. This is what separates a biblical understanding of Christianity from literally everything else. Everything else is how you can be blessed by the deity, so that if you, you check off these lists over here, do this, and then whatever God we have given you will do things for you. Christianity says, no, God has done what you are incapable of, that you are dead in your trespasses and sins, but you are alive in Christ, that you are under judgment because of the iniquity of your flesh, but because of the work that God has done on your behalf, you now stand in righteousness. It has gone from what people could do to what God has done. Anything that starts with what you need to do is a forsaking of the work that God has already done. You do what you do because of what God has done. Separate out what God has has already accomplished in Christ, what power do you have to accomplish anything good, Christian? That's why your foundations are so important. That's what's broken here. We're dealing with God's character, but as we would like it. We're dealing with God's nature, but as we would prefer it. Therefore, we're building out your accomplishment based upon what we would prefer. Just because it sounds good, just because it sounds polite and we might like where it leads, doesn't make it any less idolatry. 1 Peter 5 gives you an example. I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, that when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. What was Peter's focus? And keep in mind, 1 Peter is a letter basically telling you how you should live. <laughs> you need to bear up under trial. You need to rejoice in the salvation of Christ. You need to live as strangers and aliens. You need to have this sort of relationship, husband and wife. You need to have this relationship with your government. This is, 1 Peter is all about what you should do in life. Built, built upon what? Who you are in Christ, which is where the first chapter of the letter starts. If you don't start with the work of Christ, you have no basis for accomplishing anything. This is the failure. Which is why, amazingly enough, Job is not going to sit here and take this. Would you? I probably wouldn't either. So, Job responds. In truth, I know that this is so, but how can a man be right before God? If one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him once in a thousand times. Now, I would agree here. Is there any in their own flesh righteous before God? No. Psalm 14, Romans 3 would, uh, would give you that. If you want some good homework, read Romans 3. It will do you good. Paul lays out a bunch of Old Testament quotes to basically tell you that you left to your own devices are no good. So Job's response, how can I be righteous? How do I argue with God? And the answer is, you don't. Always remember this. What are God's terms again? We haven't covered this in a while. What are God's terms in this relationship? Surrender. Surrender. You don't fight. You don't negotiate. It's not like God goes, all right, here's the offer of Christ, redemption for your sin. Now, all right, you got a counter offer? I mean, do you get to haggle over this one? Be like, you know, that's a decent offer, God, but how about I do this, 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 and this, and then you accomplish this, and then we'll meet in the middle. Sound good? 
<laughs> you should see some of the looks I'm getting right now. See, this is why I always tell you to say things out loud because you don't always realize how dumb they are until you actually say them out loud and then you hear them and go, oh, that's not just like a little bit dumb. That's, yeah, that's, that's like all the way dumb. And what's the rule? Don't do dumb things. Don't do dumb things. That, when is that rule in effect? Always. always in effect. Always remember that. So we would agree here. You're not righteous. You probably don't want to go out of your way to confront God. <laughs> Wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has defied him without harm? This is verse 4. We're going to keep going for a minute. It is God who removes the mountains. They know not how. He who, sh I'm sorry, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble? Who commands the sun not to shine and sets a seal upon the stars? Who alone stretches out the heavens, tramples down the waves of the sea? I mean, this is, this is a good place. Who does this? God does. Do you want to pick a fight with that guy? No, because you're going to what? You're going to lose. This is a great description of God, but what has, what has it missed? What does it not start with? See, I, I've warned you this before. One of, the, um, one of the great failures of American evangelical Christianity the last 40, 50 years is that we have focused to detriment on the love of God. I said, the shoelish, shoelish child just kind of went that way. It'd be all right. <laughs> Every once in a while, you just have to go with it. <laughs> we have focused to our detriment exclusively on the love of God. And that is fine if you have a biblical foundation. But if you have a worldly foundation built upon the love of self and the pride of life, then the love of God is what? Expected. Of course God loves me. Look at me. I'm amazing. You know how I know I'm amazing? Because everyone has told me how amazing I am from the time I could remember people telling me anything. We've lost the concept of wrath, judgment, sin, iniquity, the failures. The love of God is meaningless if we don't have a people who are undeserving of love. If I need love and I should receive love because I'm awesome, well, God loves you. Duh. But when I start with, you're broken, and you're sinful, and the wrath of God abides upon you, and He loves you. Well, now that, that just caught me differently, didn't it? Here's the other side of the coin. Is God mighty? Yes. Is God powerful? Yes. Is God sovereign over His creation? Yes. Is His strength unassailable? Yes. Is there anyone who will shake their fist at God and go unpunished? No. Is there one who can negotiate and argue with God? No. But if you understand that, in absence of the righteousness that He provides to His people, the mercy and grace that He has bestowed upon sinners who do not deserve it, then you are understanding the great sky meanie who will do nothing but crush you. In other words, as we mentioned last week, Job is seeing everything in life through how he feels right now. What happens when you are guided by your feelings? <laughs> Nothing ever good comes from it. We have to remember the mercy in the midst of his work. Genesis 8, we'll go backwards again. God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed. The rain from the sky was restrained. The water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. Mention this before. Should that boat have made it? <laughs> No, not even a little bit. Do you want to sign up for that? Hey, let's get in the big wooden boat with no windows. Let's see how that goes. We'll float around the volcanoes and the eruptions and the earthquakes and the rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and we'll just see what happens. Sound like a good time? No. The, the boat survives because God is with it. It perseveres because God is steering it. God is directing it. God is upholding it. The animals aren't killing each other because God is restraining them, because God is providing, because all of these things are being done from His hand. In other words, in the midst of His judgment upon the sin of the earth, He is redeeming His people. He is rescuing His righteous ones. Forget that. Land in a really dangerous place. So, let's fast forward to verse 13. God will not turn back his anger. Beneath him crouch the helpers of Rahab. And by the way, that's well, I'm going to say it that way so you can distinguish it from uh, Rahab. One was a prostitute in Jericho. One is a sea monster. This is the non-prostitute. Okay? <laughs> Just in case you were confused. How then can I answer him and choose my words before him? Um, 
Warning, you can't. But Job is in a really, really bad place. He is in the Kenny Loggins theology territory. We are on the highway to the danger zone. <laughs> Come on, Top Gun just came out, the sequel. Got to rewind to the very first one. Come on now, you love it. Notice the complaint here. If Job were to stand before God, could he make an argument? No. You know who's realizing that? Job is. Fast forward to verse 20. Though I am righteous, my mouth will condemn me. Though I am guiltless, he will declare me guilty. Ooh. We're hinting at something very strongly here, aren't we? And what's Job hinting at? I have been wronged. I was good, and now God has done evil. We are, this is why I said we're on a highway to the danger zone. We are in a very, very, very bad place. He continues, though. I am guiltless. I do not take notice of myself. I despise my life. It is all one, therefore I say. He destroys the guiltless and the wicked. If the scourge kills suddenly, he mocks the despair of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? All right. We've been hinting at it. Job just flat out said it. God is unjust. God is unjust and he is wrong because Job is looking at the world and saying, I was good and I received ill. There are wicked people out there and they have received good. Who did that? God did that because he is the sovereign. He is the ruler. He is the one who controls the winds and the sea monsters and he controls all of these things. Therefore, if good people like me receive bad and bad people like them receive good, then God must be unjust. That's Job's argument. Isaiah 41. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Why should the Israelites trust in that? Because God is good. Because God is just and because God is righteous. How would they know that? Because they can look back and see his workings in history. This is why I started going backwards. That was Bill Dad's argument, right? Let's consult the, the wisdom of the elders, the people that have come before us. All right, Christian, let's. Let's consult the wisdom of Scripture beforehand. Job's argument is God is unjust. God is wrong in all of these things. If you were going to make an argument for God being unjust from Scripture, I wouldn't make it the way Job made it. I would make it the way I started it out. Adam and Eve deserved death. They didn't receive it. Noah deserved death. He didn't receive it. Abraham was an idolater. He deserved death. He didn't receive it. Lot, for all his complaining and all his righteousness, didn't want to leave Sodom and Gomorrah and had to negotiate with the angels on how long he could stick around. He deserved death. Jacob was a mocker. He deserved death. Joseph was a spoiled brat. He deserved death. Moses argued with God and was a murderer. He deserved death. David was a man of war. He deserved death. See, if you want to try to make an argument, do it the way the atheist does and say, look, 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 the, un the injustice of God, the taking of people that he should have been casting into hell, and he has the audacity to redeem them, that's called grace and mercy. And that is what is on display. If you're going to call God unjust, you have to say he's unjust towards me because he has given me good when I did not deserve it. The iniquity that should have been poured out upon me has been put upon Christ. Which, by the way, this is why the work of Christ is necessary. This is what preserves the justice and righteousness of God. You should bear a penalty for your iniquity, should you not? Yes. Does God have the right to pour out your judgment on anybody else? No, that would be unfair. Can he take the judgment due to me and give it to Becca? That would be terrible. Can he take Becca's judgment and give it to me? That would, that would be terrible. Then I would have a case to say, I have been wronged, which is why God takes that punishment upon where? Upon whom? Himself. Now it is just. 
Now it is righteous because you have violated my law, my standard, and I will bear your penalty. Not another sinner, but my righteousness, my righteous self. That's what's lost here. The understanding of God working justly and righteously. Seeing what He has done and understanding what He will do. This is why the promises of the garden are so important. There's going to be from the woman, a seed of the woman, who will crush the serpent and his offspring. The serpent is Satan. What are his offspring? Sin. Iniquity. Violation of the commandments of God. We need a one to crush that. We need one from God. We need God to crush that. That's the longing. That's the hope. That's where the... the, the, the spit that over there. That's where the foundation must start and must be laid. Otherwise, we've started with who? Us, and we've tried to build forward. Miss the foundation, and you could agree with Job. I look at the world around me, and I see what... Habakkuk said this. It's one of my favorite prophets. How long, O oh Lord, will you let me look upon these things? How long, Lord, will you not judge the sin? How long are you going to let this continue on? And God's answer is, not long. Not long at all. Because justice will be done and righteousness will be carried out. So, yep, I'm losing my place here. Job continues, he laments, he complains. If you want to have some real fun. <laughs> Compare Job's words in chapter 9 with the, um, the parable of the talents. Because you'll start to understand the brokenness and why where your vision is set is so important. Because the last servant who was given the one talent and went and buried it in the ground, what's his uh, punchline? Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed, and I was afraid, and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. Why was he unwilling to do anything with what he had been given? Because he was terrified of the judgment he might face. Is that God? For those who'd hate him, yes. For those that love him, no. Understanding who God is in all of his attributes, that he will judge sin, that he will redeem his people, that he will set his grace upon those who did not deserve, and that he will bring his people to a good end, is vital to understanding how you live in this world, how you forsake fear, how you live with joy, how you can have peace in the midst of battle and strife with all the things around you, because it is God who fights and God who has already overcome. Job's complaining... Is that, is that servant. It is to say, God has given me nothing but bad, nothing but evil, God is unjust, therefore my life is miserable and my life is broken. Yes, because you have forgotten who God is and what he is doing. So chapter 10, he continues complaining, I loathe my own life. I will give full vent to my complaint. I will speak and in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend with me. Notice who he's blaming still. The complaints, the problems. He's undeserving. Now, you want to see where Job's fun? Verse 8. In the midst of all of his complaining, keep in mind, we started complaining about what? Verse 13 of chapter 9 goes all the way through verse 35 of chapter 9, and then through seven verses of chapter 10, and then verse 8 here in chapter 10. Your hands fashioned and made me together, and would you destroy me? Remember now that you have made me as clay, and would you turn me into dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk, and curdle me like cheese? Clothe me with skin and flesh, and knit me together with bones and sinews. Where did Job come from? God made Job, just as God has made everyone and everything. In the midst of his complaining, in the midst of his agonizing, in the midst of his blaming of God, the foundation is still shining through. What does it look like to struggle while God drags you kicking and screaming? Looks like this. 
recognition that I'm warring against one that I can't overcome. I'm arguing with someone against whom I can't win the argument, and I'm fighting against the person who has power over everything. In other words, I'm being kind of dumb here, aren't I? <laughs> he can't help himself. He can't help it. So let's continue. Verse 12. You have granted me life and loving kindness. Your care has preserved my spirit. Yet these things you have concealed in your heart, and I know that this is within you. If I sin, then you would take note of me, and would not acquit me of my guilt. If I am wicked, woe to me. And if I am righteous, I dare not lift up my head. I am sated with disgrace and conscious of my mis misery. Should my head be lifted up, you would hunt me like a lion, and again you would show your powers against me. You renew your witness against me and increase your anger toward me. Hardship after hardship is with me. Just can't help himself, can he? If I've sinned, God should judge me. God is judging me, but I haven't sinned. Pick one, man. Pick one. He's this close, though. Why is he this close? Because he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. He who has started this journey with Job will bring him through. Job is going to whine and complain and kick and scream. And again, Christian... This is why where your hope is found and what your foundation for arguing is is so important. John 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. It's part of Jesus' prayer for the disciples. If your foundations for how you comfort, how you argue, how you try to lift people up starts anywhere other than Scripture and how it describes God, who have you started with? You. You. Notice what Bildad and Eliphaz have done. And because they have started with their understanding of God rather than God's description of himself, can they argue with Job? No, because my understanding of what I think about God versus your understanding of what you think about God, who's right? Yes. <laughs> because I'm convinced you're wrong. You're convinced I'm wrong. I'm convinced I'm right. You're convinced you're right. And around and around and around and around and around and around. Because we don't have any what? We don't have any truth. Hmm. That doesn't sound like any world you might live in, does it? I'm just trying to live out my truth. You don't have one. There is truth. There is falsehood. There is right. There is wrong. You either live in the truth, walk in the light, or you live in a lie and you walk in darkness. There's not another road. Narrow road, broad road. Narrow gate, wide gate. This is the reality of life and it has been since the beginning. What you're seeing from Job is someone who's trying to argue for a different way. I kind of like this nice broad highway, but I'd like it to lead to the narrow gate. Can we, can, we, can we work that out? Can we call the DOT to see if they can cut a path? No, don't. I take that back. Don't call the DOT. They would just make more potholes. Don't, don't ask. <laughs> but that's the problem. That's the breakdown. Is Job is arguing from a foundation where he knows what is right, but he's trying to read it through the lens of his life. In other words, he's trying to put himself into the story, and that's corrupting his understanding. And that's why he's recognizing that the truth of God is that he is righteous, and that he is just, and that he will judge sin, and he will lift up his people whom he has created, and he will preserve them to the final day. But I don't really feel like that today, so what have I done? Why are you mad at me? What's the fight? Let's, let's hash this out. You end up with a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, because he is no longer grounded on the truth of Scripture. So, it gets worse. Why then have you brought me out of the womb? Would that I had died and no eye had seen me. You know, just when you think you can't keep longing for death, Job's like, oh yeah, oh yeah? There's a bottom of the barrel, and then you know what we're going to do? We're going to dig under the barrel and find something that's even lower. Psalm 139. You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We know this one. We read this every year. Most churches do it. Sanctity of Life Sunday, right? I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. Here's the, here's the important part. And in your book were written... All the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Verse 20, here in Job. Would, not, would he not let my few days alone? Withdraw from me that I may have a little cheer. 
Who's ordained Job's days? God has. Who knows that? Job does. So, time out, real quick. If God is sovereign, as Job has said, that he can't argue with him, he can't atta attack him, he can't win the argument. If God has caused all this, as Job has said, and we know this is true, because remember who picked the fight? Job, uh, God picked the fight in chapter 1. And if God has not killed him, as Job keeps wishing for, then Christian, what should we be doing going forward? If we have a sovereign God who has ordained your days and who has kept you alive and is persevering you through this trial, what is your calling in, this, in the midst of this? To trust in Him, to walk faithfully, and to proclaim His goodness and mercy in spite of the sin and iniquity that surround you and in spite of the world and in spite of the fleshly desires that are spurring up. It's Ephesians 2.10. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. See, Job knows the truth, but he's not applying the truth. What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is knowing stuff. Wisdom is knowing what to do with the stuff that you know. What is the Bible constantly calling you towards? Wisdom. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how much or how little you know. It matters how faithful are you to the grace that God has given, to the knowledge that you have, to the answer. This is why, look... If I brought you a seminary graduate, someone with a Ph.D. in theology, and said, Hey, do me a favor. Sit down and explain substitutionary atonement. Would you, you would expect, like, a presentation, right? You would expect, you know, the demonstration of years of knowledge and to be able to run through this. Now, if I grabbed a five-year-old and said, Hey, explain to me substitutionary atonement. And they looked at you and went, Um, Jesus died for my sin. What would you say to the five-year-old? That's very good. That's right. What should you do now? I should trust in God, and I should serve Him. If your five-year-old gave you that, you'd be dancing in the streets, right? You'd be like, I will take that. That's, a, that's where we... Why? Because that's what they know. And that's what they're capable of understanding. That's the knowledge that they have. And wisdom would dictate that you would expect them to try to live in light of that bit of knowledge. Job has way more knowledge than that. But what is he doing? <laughs> it's a good way of describing it. So instead, before I go, and I shall not return, to the land of darkness and deep shadow, to the land of utter gloom as darkness itself, of deep shadow without order, and which shines as the darkness. What's Job want to do? Die. I want to die and be left alone, Christian. This is what brokenness leads you to. This is what a world devoid of any hope in the work of God looks like. And Job knows better. What would a world that doesn't know any better look like? What would a world that doesn't know better long for and teach its children and, its, and everything about it? What's been broken here? The brokenness you're seeing on display is Eliphaz, Bildad, and Job in their understanding of where God's work is found and where the hope of humanity in light of that work is found. Um, it's a misunderstanding of God. Look at the world around you. Do they understand God? What He accomplishes? What His judgment upon sin will look like in the hope that is found in Christ? No. Therefore, the world is broken. What's the cure, Christian? How do you answer Job? If that answer starts with anything other than the mercy of God in the face of judgment against sin, then it started in the wrong place. Because everything for the Christian life begins with an understanding of how that Christian life starts. And it starts in repentance of sin and trusting in the work of Christ to overcome that. It starts with the acceptance of Christ's work and the understanding that it is His righteousness that carries us forward. It is Him that has set us free from sin. It is Him that has ushered in our covenant with God. It is Him who will preserve us to that right day. It is His life that ensures the eternal kingdom that is coming. It is His finishing the work upon the cross that redeems us from the curse of the law, that redeems us from the penalty of sin and sets us on the path of sanctification. If you don't start there, then you have started with some other God and some other idol. And this is what that leads to. 
I've told you this. Idols break the hearts of their worshipers. Always have, always will. But remembering where we stand and why we stand is what is so, so important. So what Paul talks about, if we've believed in Christ, for, if we've hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most miserable. Where's Job's hope for godliness in, in God? Where's his hope for righteousness? It's in this life. Where's Bildad's hope for the accomplishment and justice of God? It's in this life. Where was Eliphaz's understanding of justice? It was found in this life. If everything is founded in this life, we are most to be pitied, most miserable because we have nothing. Our eyes have to be lifted up. Christian, your eyes have to be lifted up. As you look at the world around you, you have to see the long game, the long accomplishment. Yes, life can be miserable now. There is illness and there is crime and there is deceit and there is lying and there is iniquity and sin of every kind. But there is God who is changing hearts and minds, who is lifting us up, who is saving people day by day, and who, in spite of what this world may do, will bring to a good end for His children all that He has promised. And that is where our hope must be found. Let's pray.